All right. How's everyone doing today? I'm great. Awesome. <laughs> the Keisha answered <laughs> earlier. Good, good. Ready to go. Awesome. Awesome, Ronald. Nice. Yeah. So today we're just going to focus on um, pretty much cold calling and kind of what exactly we're saying. And we're going to do some role play and things like that, too. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling something up here. Yeah. So in terms of that, um, I guess we can kind of start off with questions in terms of specifically, hey, what am I doing wrong? What can I be doing better in terms of speaking with these agents? And we'll kind of just let the conversation flow from there. And there's a couple of things that both Alex and I wanted to touch on as well, too, in terms of pitching this stuff to agents and what exactly we should be saying. So I noticed um, some people in the chat today were talking about um, mentioning role playing, being kind of afraid. Um, sorry, I'm looking at, I'm scrolling up through the Discord chat here. Um, mentioning like being nervous to hop on the phone and things like that. So I'm wondering how we could kind of get over those nerves and feel more comfortable getting on the phone and actually speaking to agents. Because I'd say that's one big thing right there is the analysis paralysis of just being able to grab my phone, pick it up, start dialing and talking. And I, some people laughed, <laughs> but like literally that's the way I did it. Like um, I just view it as, I'm on the phone with these people. This isn't face-to-face -face sales. I'm not sitting in an office. If I screw up or say something stupid or if there's some sort of weird confrontation, all I do is click one button and I'll never talk to those people again in my life, right? So there's nothing to really be nervous about. Not saying, um, you know, people are super nervous and things, but I know it can be a little nerve wracking when you're just starting out doing this. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to touch on that point. Just very low stress. Shouldn't be something that's overthought. Um, we'll definitely get some role playing in today with that, but wondering if anyone has questions in terms of kind of just the whole cold calling process in general and what exactly we should be saying and structuring things. Cause Alex and I are going to go over everything and kind of touch on some things some more, but I'm wondering first, if we want to open it up to some questions and see um, if anyone has any. Nothing, nothing yet. I'm like I'm looking I, forward to hearing the role playing. I guess okay. how do you what's the best and maybe in the role playing this will get answered, but the best way to like even just start the call when you're when you get somebody on the phone. I mean, yeah. Like we're saying we're calling in regards to this address, right? And and um wanted to find more information out about uh whether you're interested in taking a cash offer. We always start with cash offer, right? Um, so yeah, the best way to start off the call would just be, you know, really like any call, just introducing yourself. Right. Hey, hey, Mr. Smith, I saw your listing on one, two, three main street. My name's Maria. Um, that really actually catches my eye and I'm, I'm pretty interested in it. And then introduce yourself. Um, Alex and I were kind of talking about it too, because we are in the process of getting a website built and having like an actual name to this and everything too. But as for now, in terms of what we're saying, it could mainly just be, um, I work with a handful of partners, um, that purchase properties in the area or something like that until we have like that trademarked name with website and things like that. Right, Alex? Is that what we were? Yeah. Yeah. There doesn't need to be a company specified when you're on that conversation. You could just say, Hey, I work with a group of investors and I came across, across this listing and just based off the pictures and the size of the house, I think it could be a good fit for my partners and I. Could you tell me a little bit more about the property? Yeah. And it's pretty much as simple as that. And then it just goes to the point of, I was telling someone I was on the phone with earlier today, like do not bring up sub two or creative within the first handful of minutes of the call. You want to okay. definitely build rapport first and ask about the property and, you know, not just be like, Hey, are you open to creative finance or sub two? Um, mm -hmm. And then you're, you're essentially trying to disqualify that traditional cash offer scenario. Um, so that can yeah. take anywhere from two minutes to 15 minutes. Um, it's definitely going to be very hard to do that within a couple of minutes on, on the call right away. You definitely want to build that rapport more. And um, we have some examples of that. I mean, even Alex and I can run like a role play um, as well too, before we do breakout rooms with everybody um, running the role play. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I guess if, if we're disqualifying the cash offer, what if we are, they, we say, you know, are you open to cash offer? And they're like, yeah, what do you, what do you want to offer me? And yeah. then, you know, what is next? 
Kind yeah. Of the way you could word that is just be like, hey, have any other investors came in with a low cash offer and try not to try not to put out a cash offer if you don't need to. If they really are asking for a number, like Jack had said previously, just take the asking price and multiply it by 0. 0.60, so 60%. And so that's just like a brief, quick way to kind of come in with the number that most cash investors are coming in with. And mm -hmm. so we're obviously going to be coming in with a much better offer, right? We're typically able to pay close to asking, if not asking. Mm -hmm. So that's another incentive for the agent and the seller to want to work with us. Yes, we are investors, but we're paying prices that aren't very far off from traditional offers. Okay. Yeah. And one thing too, that's important as well. Like when I used to do direct to seller stuff, um, we'd call, we'd call it dropping the anchor and instantly picking it back up. Cause for example, like Alex said, why we want to try to avoid giving a number unless they really push for it is if their listings for 400 K and I tell them I'm at 210, they're instantly going to get really pissed off. Well, not all the time, but they're going to say, Oh, these people aren't serious. They're lowballing like Matt. I don't want to even listen to anything else they have to say. Right. So something that could be good if they're really pushing for a number, honestly, I don't even want to offend you with a number like that. Um, cash offer wise, we're investors here. We have to make money. So we're usually quite a bit below asking, but with this current scenario here, I think we could totally present something else that would work where we'd actually be able to come up close to um, the list price, like Alex okay. just said. Okay. Um, but then if they really push for a number, then it's something that you could drop like 60% okay. of the listing price. Um, ideally, we don't want to do that though, because sometimes it does offend them. But as long as you basically make it aware that, hey, I know this probably won't work. I don't want to yeah. do this, but this is one of the options we have if you don't want to take option B. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Was there another question with that or do you want to follow up with something, Alex? Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and unmute you so you could ask your question. Here. Okay, so my question, can you hear me okay? Am I echoing? Yep, you're yep. no, you're good. Okay, my question is, um, based on what you guys were just talking about with the first call and not wanting to bring up sub two or creative within the first couple of minutes. Um, so my question is, is it better to almost try and make a second call out of it and just call, find out about the property, let them know who I am, talk about it and then like try to ask about um creative the next time or you want to get that done in the first call you can definitely get it done in the first call that's what we usually do um you could also totally make it a two call <laughs> ordeal though too um because i mean the thing is like urgency and timing is very important with this and you know making mm -hmm. a, a two call thing could be a 48 hour kind of delay in terms of the sequence yeah. um which we would prefer to try to avoid um but essentially you could literally disqualify the typical cash offer in the first call. Like honestly, just looking at this from our investor standpoint, um, cash wise, we're going to be a lot, a lot lower than the ask price, but um, we have another okay, alternative cool. that could, that could get the seller what they want. That, that was my question. Like wondering if it would be less painful. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Wouldn't you agree, Alex? I'd say try to keep that to, to one call, I'd say the second call would be maybe more so if that agent didn't have specifics in terms of remaining mortgage balance, PITI, um, interest rate, things like that. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. To that, to that question, so as we're getting in and we're like, hey, we can get you an offer, the cash offer would come in quite low. I, I could give you what that is, but you know, it's, it's low, but uh, we have another way of getting you close to your asking price. Um, what is like the next, do we get into some of the details, how we do that? Or, um, is it, you know, what are, what are, I just need some, I just more, need information. some more information what are, what are information, and then we're following that back up with you guys, or how do we know like what the, to go into the deal or what to say to go into, go into the, into the whole yeah, yeah. So right, so right, right when, right you, when you said you that, said that, that um, um, someone's, someone's mic is, mic is echoing. echoing. Um, um, I think it's Lakeisha's, Lakeisha's, if you don't mind me. Oh, you got it. Cool. Yeah. So one thing, like kind of like what you were saying, um, Maria, um, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. What was the exact point you left off on? I know what you were asking in terms of where we're pivoting to, but I was going to take over your sentence um, of when you disqualify that cash offer. Okay. Yeah. I remember you could basically yeah. say, 
what if we just came in and took over your existing, um, the seller's existing mortgage payments? You could either mm -hmm. go with that route or you could say, well, if the seller's open to terms, um, I'd be able to come up a lot closer to their ask price. So that's like okay. two ways you can go about it. And then of course, they're probably going to ask questions. Well, what does that look like? How would that work? And then you, you would kind of go into the brief explanation of what we do, how we yeah. do it pretty frequently to build credibility. Um, you know, you could always just leverage us, like our partners, yeah. my partners I work with, we, we close quite a decent amount of these. Um, and then, you know, you're going to want, of course, to, to get the, uh, exact number. What are you laughing at, Alex? Uh, in, in our, uh, little, uh, uh, okay. My bad. Um, <laughs> I thought I was doing something. Um, yeah. So pretty much from there, from that point, you're just going to want to, basically leave the floor open to the agent and see what sort of questions they have with what you say, and then likely answer any sort of objections they have. And in the uh, helpful documents, we will have those common objections to answer that the agents will usually ask. If there is something that you don't know off the top of your head, then that's of course something where you can kind of pivot. Honestly, like my partners are the main ones that do a ton of these and all the financials. Um, I could totally check with them or we could all hop on a call and they can answer any specific questions. But mainly, you should be able to get out of it the the PITI, the remaining mm -hmm. balance, the interest rate, and everything like that we would need. Then there's also scenarios, too, where an agent might be, I think Pierce messaged me earlier today about this, where an agent's just like, hey, I don't know the exact numbers, just send me something in writing, and they kind of have their shield up. Mm -hmm. That's going to be like a lower probability of anything happening from that, but we can still mm -hmm. send them in like an LOI template without numbers, just describing what we're going to do and what we're offering. And then- Hopefully they then present that to their seller and um, we can actually get legit exact numbers to make that offer. Yeah. And, and just real quick, I want to add when they ask, okay, well, what are you willing to offer? Typically in our offers, we're able to pay closing costs, pay their commission, which is very, very important because they're speaking to agents and everyone want to, wants to know like, what about for me? Like, why is this good for me? Well, because we're paying their commission at a much higher purchase price than if they were to sell to a cash offer, a low ball cash offer. And so it's just another incentive for the agent to want to proceed with us. Yeah, that's very true. That's a good point. Yeah. Always ensuring and making sure with that agent too, like, hey, I just want to make sure you're taken care of too. I want to make sure we get your commission paid. We can help the seller out and not just have this hoping that someone will come in at the ask price because I know it's been sitting a while. You know, it's going to be, the more you do this, the more you'll you'll learn how it varies situationally. But for yeah. example, like if I see something that's only on market six days, I'll have a slightly different approach to it than I would with the, the property that's been on market for 110 days. Mm -hmm. um, 110 days would be more of that approach of, you know, I know the seller's probably kind of bleeding right now out of their pockets and, you know, we really need to make something work. I could totally come in and just take over those existing payments. I want to make sure this doesn't go expired. I want to make sure your commission gets paid. You don't have to worry about that. I'll take care of your full commission and um, maybe even be able to give the seller some money in their pocket to walk away with as well, too. Of course, depending on the equity in that whole situation. Um, so, yeah. And then you'd have a slightly different approach with this has only been on market for five days. We're not looking at anything like that. Yeah, I just saw on, on my end of things, on my data here, that it looks like there's not much equity in this in this listing where I'm basically just throwing that out there. If you want to have me on the back burner, um, definitely feel free to reach back out to me. Like sometimes we're just planting the seed in the agent's brain because um, ideally if there's not much equity in that property, three weeks later, it's probably going to be sitting in the same spot and we might be first on their backup offer list. Okay. Now, if they ask for some of this information in writing, like in terms of the what we're asking them for, so the PITI, um, remaining balance and all of that and interest rate, are we using our own email address to communicate that, right? Yeah. As of now, yes. Um, soon, Alex and I are trying to get a website and, and an actual domain and like company name for what we're doing here. Um, okay. And then I, I don't know how we would do that yet. I don't know. It would still maybe be your personal um, your personal email, but then you can like CC the company that you work with, which would be us. Or maybe we could get everyone an individual email if they've been in the group for a long enough time or something like that. Got it. Okay. Thank I mean, you. I'm just saying that. Right, Alex? Does that sound like a decent yeah. idea? No, I agree with you. You're, you're spot on. Gotcha. 
yeah any any other questions then in terms of, of calling and that whole uh the whole structure yeah sunny yeah so if i understand what i'm hearing um correctly then um i'm not looking to solve their problem i'm looking to see if they're a fit for the criteria that you've given me is that my understanding they kind of intertwine with one another um because essentially us pitching sub two is likely solving their problem at the same time um because we're pulling lists sometimes there's errors in prop stream though where something will have a lot of equity even though on prop stream it said otherwise sometimes there's just errors like that where there could be something that seems like it, it works as a hybrid deal where there's you know 80k equity in the deal um, more so of solving someone's problem is hey i'm dead set on this price i need this amount of money okay well we can come in we can take over the existing payments and then do a carry on that equity and then give you the 10k you need to walk away with just to get this thing sold quickly um so they kind of intertwine i mean i don't know that what do yeah. you think alex no, I, kinda... I i feel like they go hand in hand with each other i think in terms of solving their problem it's more so you're finding the motivation of the seller. And once you're able to understand what the motivation of the seller is, you're better able to understand what your offer needs to be in order to make them find it attractive, right? Because if But their motivation may not even be anything like what the criteria is. So um, what do I do with that? Um, oh, you don't fit into ours. I have no one to refer you to that's um, that that criteria would fit i want to um you know i'm trying to build a relationship with this person because this person is a, a real estate agent that could give me more leads this is a criteria i'm looking for i um we could partner if you find things like this this fits in my wheelhouse um but then this particular one doesn't um you know, I, does that make sense what I'm saying? So are you basically asking if they shoot down sub two and say they're not open to someone coming in and taking over the existing mortgage, how you can potentially still keep that relationship with that agent? Yeah. Afloat? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So honestly, then you could say, well, honestly, for our business model, sometimes we do, um, this just depends. So for us personally, right now, I don't know, Alex, I don't want to speak for Alex. Um, I don't want cash deals being sent to me. Because a lot of the time it's, you're going to get on an agent's like just list and you're going to get email blasted with a bunch of garbage. And unfortunately we don't have time to go, to go through a bunch of garbage. Like we're trying to focus specifically on the, the sub two low equity seller finance, you know, creative deals like that. Um, so, I mean, you could say we're basically specializing in taking over existing payments and, and seller financing. Those are the kind of deals right. we're looking for. Um, kind of our criteria is we're looking around to get into a deal with less than 10% of the whole purchase price of the property. So if it's worth 200 K we'd like to be in at less than 20 K um, preferably turnkey things. And then you could kind of go in and explaining about certain scenarios on deals. Your partners have done previously where someone got a divorce and there wasn't equity in the deal. So we came in and took over the existing payments rather than them putting it on market and taking a loss after paying com uh, agent commissions and closing costs and things like that. Um, you could also leverage another example, like one I just closed on recently where the seller had a bunch of dogs and some family health issues and things like that, where they didn't want showings or anything like that. So we came in and we just took over their existing payments as an investor. Um, but I mean, just basically hitting the nail on the head with mainly the sub two stuff. When someone doesn't have any equity in a deal, we can come in and take care of it and make sure you get paid your commission. Um, as long as you're emphasizing that that agent's going to get paid their commission, you can sometimes beat them before they even list a property on market, knowing that it probably won't move at that price. And they have someone in their back pocket that they know can come in and take over the existing payments. Anything, anything else to add on that, Alex? No, that, that was perfectly well said. I think pivoting once they shut down the subject to offer to relationship building is the best way to go. So as soon as you hear that they're not interested in a sub two and it doesn't sound like it's going to make sense for the sellers, go into relationship building, put that property behind you and and just focus on the relationship. I felt like that is the best way to get sent, have you get sent deals from agents. Yeah. And, and then so once that, I, sorry. 
Oh, yeah. Sorry. We'll, we'll go with uh, Sebastian and Daniel first. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, we, go ahead. No worries. No worries. Sebastian. I think Daniel has his hand. Oh, okay. First. Gotcha. Daniel. Yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay. I guess I'll go. Hey. So, what happens if you think that you do have equity in the home? Just you, there's a lot I'm hearing a lot of just move on to the next person. So, is that really the, the, what you're looking at? That would, yeah, that would be something that's kind of more situational. Like if it was on market for, let's say, more than a month and a half, then that could be something that would be worth exploring because, hey, they're kind of stuck at that price. It's not moving at that price and it's been on market for a decent amount of time. But well, if there's some. I'm, I'm seeing a couple where uh, it says that they took 15000 down, you know, they price dropped or recently here that kind of thing yeah i mean if they are open if, if you speak with an agent and the agent says that they are open to hearing potential offers of us coming in taking over payments and potentially them being open to carrying some equity so like a hybrid deal or if they're open to terms we'd still be able to definitely make an offer or something happen on it it's just a lower likelihood of someone being willing to do that if they can just price drop more and just get a traditional sale and get their cash mm -hmm. right. just a lower likelihood okay yeah i just Guess you gotta try to ask those questions and see where it goes. So. Yeah. Um, Sebastian. Yeah, my question was more along the same lines because I I have been getting a lot of uh, properties that have equity on them, and a lot of the times the the agents telling me that the seller is looking to use that to purchase another property so i'm trying to see if it could be uh if if even a hybrid could be a solution for them um so i, I just wanted to see if, if something worth pursuing if if it made sense to the seller um yeah. or or should i just continue to move on because again i i am seeing a lot of the properties um have equity uh yeah I, I would likely, kitchen. yeah, I would likely say just move on, um, depending on the scenario, of course, like say the house is worth 200 K there's a mortgage of 160 in place. And for some reason, no offers are coming in at 200 K and they're just firm at 200 K. Well, we could offer them, you know, it's just situational, right? So say if they wanted 10 K for a construction project or something like that, we could give you 10 K and then we could carry that remaining whatever 20 or 30 K over the course of X amount of years. Um, but if they needed 30 or 40 K lump sum upfront for a different purchase that they absolutely needed, then a carry on that equity, a hybrid probably wouldn't be the best of fits. They would more so want like 40 or 50 K cash for that. And then us taking yeah. over the mortgage. But if the house is only worth 200 K and we're paying them 40 K cash and then paying our finders fee, closing costs, holding costs, things like that, then that's like a 20 plus percent entry fee that just kills the deal for us and isn't a deal. So it's just okay. going to be situational. Yeah. Okay. And uh, since this has happened a lot, I am, you know, building the relationship with the agents. They uh, seem to, to to be open to, to, you know, if they have another client or another property that could fit this criteria, they're asking me, you know, like more or less what would be our buy box for these type of properties. Um, I tell them, you know, something low equity. Uh, we normally like to stay, you know, no more than 10% of the um, value of the property. But yeah. in terms of, I guess, square footage, bedrooms, anything like that, or actual price points, should I say anything? Or if it makes sense, if it, you know, if they have a, a great interest rate and, and, it makes sense. It doesn't matter the price point and, and the bedrooms and things like that. Yeah. It doesn't really matter too much. Cause the thing is like for what we're trying to keep, like I see people wholesale, I shouldn't say all the time, but I've seen like studios wholesaled before. Um, so not even one bed, one baths, like studios wholesaled. I've seen like mansions wholesaled. It really just depends on the terms. Um, it's going to be a lot harder for us to either buy something ourselves. Ideally we're trying to buy as much as we can ourselves, but for things that don't fit our exact criteria then we'll assign it um so we have had a handful of like super higher end not mansions but closer to that like million dollar figure range or up there or triple or four x the median home price for that city um not saying a deal can't be done with those 
but it's a lot, lot harder to actually move them. And it's harder for us in terms of our exit. So something like that, we'd likely assign, but I wouldn't say, Hey, I don't want to look at these at all. We're pretty much open to anything as long as it's in decent shape and relatively turnkey move in ready. And as long as we can get it, you know, close to that 10% entry, it's definitely something still worth having an agent send our way. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. And then Maria. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So no worries. a couple of things, when we come across ones that just don't work, we're going to build the relationship with the agent, but are we just disqualifying that lead on our lead list then? And just putting notes and saying this didn't work for this address. Yeah. I would just disqualify it. Alex, isn't there something that you click that says like cold as well? Like the lead is cold. I think it was like warm, hot, cold. cold right. legit. Yeah. There's so, a, I believe it's agent temperature, but you could use it as a lead temperature, whatever fits okay. better. So we'll just click cold when it's just a solid no for that property yeah. then. And for the properties on the lead list, they've already been scrubbed to the best of the ability based on prop stream information that they're low equity and that the ARV is what the purchase price is at then or? Um, so that's so that's the thing with like prop stream. It's kind of just an estimator. Um, and we actually kind of tweak something a little bit which I think it's going to yield better results. Like Alex and I were talking about it uh, the other night where we're actually doing now nothing, nothing um, purchased farther back than three years and then nothing purchased um, more recently than within a year. Because if we, if we're looking at anything from a year ago to now, the interest rates likely going to be in that seven plus range. Mm -hmm. And then anything past three years ago um, is going to have a lot of equity. Whereas mm -hmm. previously we were just trying to use like 10%, like the estimators from the prop stream filters. And then that allows more room for error. I mean, it's to the best of the, the services ability and our ability to try to narrow it down to the, the best criteria and likelihood as possible, but that still doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. And then those numbers on prop stream that are pulled, um, usually a decent amount of time they're correct, but it's always good to just look up that address on Zillow too. So you can see pictures while you're calling. And then also just confirm that the phone number there is also the same one that PropStream had. Because sometimes it gets the agent cell confused with the brokerage firm's number and, and things like that. Got it. And as yeah. far as like, if, sorry. Sorry, I just want to say something to Maria too. I realized that, you know, where it says hot and cold, you can actually go in there and edit it. What I put is um, um, person didn't answer and stuff like that. So you always know you can just go back. So you can actually add things to the emojis and stuff like that your own oh, little nice. text okay i like that i like that idea ronald yeah that might be a good one like and one thing for everyone in here like that suggestions tab in the team thing in discord like if anyone has any ideas or things like that to to make it better for everyone um feel free to to share that in there because i actually like that idea in terms of making it easier to keep track of things than typing it out yeah, yeah what specific. i did with mine was i met one for the temperature of the lead and one for the temperature of the agent. So I know if the agent was open to like work and I said, the agent's warm or hot. And if the lead was like, he said, no, this, this seller definitely doesn't want to do uh subject to, but I can, you know, look around and see if I have something else. And I differentiate one from the other. Awesome. And one thing I want to touch on Sebastian that you just kind of brought up to me is when an agent tells you they're not interested there's two ways you could go about it. One way I really like to go about it is I'm like, oh, so it sounds like you kind of already had the conversation with the seller and they'll be like, yeah. And they'll give the reason why. And just try to dig deeper because sometimes you'll get stopped at that surface level uh, answer when if you dig a little deeper, you could usually find a way around that objection they have. And I've noticed it's it's helped me get further in some leads and others that I kind of just stopped at that mark. I personally heard that work for him earlier today. It definitely works. Yeah, I agree. Cause that we, you know, I, I've gotten a few properties where the agent said, this is like the 30th person that's called me about seller finance or creative finance and definitely not interested. Um, but then I've gotten the person who said, yeah, we're not really interested about that. And I kind of had trouble kind of digging or overcoming that, that seller, because it's that seller mentality. He doesn't really understand 
most likely he doesn't really understand subject to, and that's why he's not willing to present it to the to the seller. Um, so that's that's great. I, I'm gonna use that on on my future calls. And, and I also realize too sometimes they'll be like, "Oh yeah, we're not interested." And if you're calling about sub two, and I'll be like, "Uh, what is that? Can you explain that to me?" Just to try to see if they understand what they're talking about, and then when if they don't understand. Obviously, I go in for the kill at that point. <laughs> nice. That's good feedback. Uh, One last, so all, only second question that I had was this list as far as like knowing if what the estimated value is, so the purchase price to the estimated value, so saying that doesn't need a ton of repairs. If we get down the road of getting into like the offer and things like that, has this list been scrubbed that it's at the right purchase price based on repairs and everything that are needed or does that need to be vetted? Um, so you're talking about like the exact value that PropStream is showing on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just a guesstimate from PropStream. Just like when you're on Zillow, like Zillow will show the Zestimate same with like realtor. They'll have estimates from based off square footage and, you know, recent listings that sold nearby. So that's not going to be, it's somewhat accurate, but not super accurate. And then of course the alternative for that is us underwriting every single lead. I mean, every single um, phone number or address. And, you know, that's just super, super, super. Like we do that once we get, you know, numbers or interest, and then we really underwrite it and see what it's actually worth. Um, but yeah, that, that wouldn't really be something I, I'd worry about at all. Um, okay. right now. No, I'm just saying, as we're saying, we're, we can take over, we can give you what you're asking. That's just based on the information that's there, the, the guesstimate or whatever, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And then we could always come back and say, honestly, after running numbers, I was looking at so-and-so on this street and this house is three away that sold four months ago. Um, the numbers look a little tighter. We'd have to be here, you know? Okay, got it. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then uh, Tyler? Yeah, my question is, usually when I get, you know, I'm cold calling these agents and everything, and when they are, like, up for it, some of my biggest questions, I mean, problems I've had is when I'm getting down to the PITI, like, they're up for it, and then I'm like, okay, I need the PITI, and for starters, none of the agents ever know, like, what it is, yeah. and then usually when it does come up, they kind of get defensive and, like, they don't want to continue. How do you guys kind of overcome that? I would just say, so one thing I can see hesitation on, I've heard it before, is when I say, can you go back and get a copy of the mortgage statement or a picture of the mortgage statement to send to me? That can sometimes bring up a little bit of, a, of hesitation there and them getting a little sketched out. But you could also say, do you know exactly what the seller's monthly payment is? If you could check back with them and get exactly what they're paying monthly for the property, um, aka the PITI, and then also the remaining balance and then the interest rate, I'd totally be able to get some exact numbers in writing for you and be able to send those over your way. So you shouldn't really get too much pushback if you're kind of wording it like that. I could see you getting a decent amount of pushback occasionally if you're saying, can you send me over a picture of the mortgage statement? Um, what, do you, what do you think with that, Alex? Yeah, I agree with you. I think one thing to just remember is you don't want to ask for the mortgage statement or details like that until you feel like there's been a, a decent amount of rapport built. You want to really make sure the agent trusts you and and knows you're serious about this inquiry. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I usually save it for like the like the end of the call when like we've worked everything out and we're kind of like on good terms. And then I'm like, I kind of shoot that question out there and then it's always usually kills the call. It's just like, oh, well, I need to, I don't know how to overcome this section. I've overcome all the other ones. This is the like the last step, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would just say like in order for me to get something over in writing, so you can present to your sellers, um, I would just need to know the exact monthly payment they're making, their remaining balance and their interest rate, just so I can run some numbers myself and see exactly where I need to be. And I don't see why they'd give any sort of, you know, objection or ma major hesitation from that point, if you word it that way. Got you. Okay. Yeah. So that was, just reword it. Got gotcha. you. Or how were how were you kind of saying? Were you just saying PITR? Were you saying, um, can you send over a picture of your mortgage statement? Or yeah, I was just saying basically like, you know, everything sounds good and it's working out. The last thing we would need to submit an offer is we just need the PITI, 
And then I was like, it was, as soon as we get that, we can send an offer over. Um, and then that's usually like when it goes dead because they don't know it. And then they don't want to like go ask the, the seller for it. So it kind of goes dead. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I would say explain it. I mean, I would hope all agents know what PITI is, but I would explain it and refer to PITI as principal interest taxes insurance, AKA the monthly payment, um, the remaining balance, the interest rate, just so we know where we need to be at numbers wise. And um, so I can give an a legit exact offer in writing. If they don't know that and seem like they don't want to do that, then we can send over something in writing. Um, that's more broad, just saying what we're doing, which would be taking over the existing payments. Um, but we can't really have numbers on there, but at least they have to hopefully legally present that to their client. And then if their client or the seller was interested in moving forward with that, then they would get back to us with numbers. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm looking at Sonny's question here. Isn't there a software that can pull that information for the PITI? PropStream does it. A lot of services do it. It's only accurate maybe like 70% of the time though. Um, so there's too much error in it to be um, confident in it, I would say. Yeah. And then, I don't know, do we have time for more questions, Alex, or should we jump into the role play? Let's, um, let's do one more and then we'll... Okay, uh, Noah? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Cool. Um, so just a question, cause out of respect for you guys and you guys applying the list to us, obviously I want to make sure we're on the same page, but I just want to say, obviously we're, we're strictly going towards certain types of, you know, sub two primarily, but obviously, obviously, like I said, I found a seller financing earlier, but let's just say we just qualify everything and there's nothing that you're comfortable with doing as a lead that I've gotten from you guys. What is your role and how do you feel about, hey, I, I find somebody else who's willing to wholesale or seller finance or do some other some other type of creative finance? How do you guys want to go about things like that? Because obviously I want to respect you guys, your list, our agreement. Yeah. But if there's a chance for me to do something still, obviously in my book, even as a realtor, I don't disqualify leads just because of one thing to me. I'm willing to branch out and try other things and keep going with it if I can. I don't give up on it, I guess you can say. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, that's something Alex and I could kind of discuss too. I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head right now. Um, Cause like I was saying, kind of at the start of this call here for me, it's like very low yield for myself when someone sends me a cash deal or something like that, like, or a multifamily deal that I'm like, maybe there's a deal here, but just time-wise and for what I'm trying to do with, with primarily getting these subject to deals and wrapping them, me trying to run numbers and wholesale a cash deal um, just isn't worth the ROI. Um at least for what we're trying to build. So I, I'm, I'm just kind of, that's definitely something to think about. And that is a good question. Um, so you're basically saying if, if you're calling an agent off of one of our lists and it doesn't work there for like a creative deal, but then they send you something else that looks like it works well as a cash deal, how we would proceed about that. Uh, I guess I explained that maybe wrong a little bit. It's more so let's just say there's nothing that you guys are capable of doing or something you don't want to <laughs> lot of right so there's a situation that buyer sellers want to do some type of creative finance and it's something that just doesn't work for you guys number wise whatever it is okay. but i'm able to go to somebody i know personally let's say and he's a um maybe a gator lender i don't know you the world there's there's so many opportunities out there is what i'm saying so if i know somebody who's willing to take on that deal in another man you know method because you guys have disqualified it said hey we're not interested in doing it there's just too much risk in it for us i want yep. to know how to because I want to follow what you guys would like to do. But from what I'm seeing, it's basically if it disqualifies from you guys, it doesn't make sense to, you know, keep the lead for you guys if no one's going to do anything with it. If, if I can That's make true. something up with somebody else. So That's I just want to make sure I respect you at the end of the day. And we're yeah. on the same. Yeah. So no, I assume I... I could bring it to you and, you know, we can make an agreement and say, okay, you guys disqualified it. Maybe you don't have any questions on it. You don't think you can do anything with it okay no you can go ahead and take it if you have somebody who wants to take it feel free i i don't mind as long as you've discussed it with us yeah That's i what... honestly think alex and i can kind of discuss it further but i mean no i think you brought us that one with that um that like higher end home in okc right correct yes okay yeah so that's kind of like one as an example there um well potentially um so yeah, that that's a good question. I'm I'm I don't really have a problem with it. The only thing where I kind of think of that could be a problem is um obviously not saying cuz you're a realtor of course, you're not like 
a, a newbie to this, but I'm just saying for some of the people that are newer to the group where you could get major shiny object syndrome from a bunch of, of part of my language shit, <laughs> where it's like, there could be a lot of deals that look terrible. Um, but Hey, this realtor that you spoke with on the phone says, Oh, this looks decent. Or you see here, it looks cheaper than the other comparables. And then now you're, you're taking time away from doing stuff that'll yield, yield something um, for yourself and the group as well. But then at the same time, I do agree that I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that we will pass on that might work maybe for someone else. But ideally, if something doesn't work for us, we'll then wholesale it or assign it to someone else. So, um, and that's just usually the general rule of of thumb for everybody. If something's close to a 10% entry fee, give or take, you know, 3%, um, there's still a chance that we'll be able to move it and probably lock it up. But then there's, there's those exceptions like that one, where there's not really an exit strategy, that one in OKC, where it's a higher end house, um, the interest rate's like five point something percent, um, the monthly payments like almost five grand. Um, it's not going to rent by the room. It's not going to work as a long term rental. Um, the only thing I could think of there is maybe getting it for zero down and like giving the agent nothing, almost giving the seller nothing, and then trying to wrap it to someone else who'd want to live in it at like two percent higher, at like a seven percent interest rate. Um, that's just an example I can think of the top of my head, but that's not something that we want to chase. And I don't think a lot of people would want to chase one like that, but yeah, it's definitely something to think about. Well, I mean, what do you think, Alex? Yeah, no, I, I don't think I would really change anything from what you said. I think chances are you bring us a lead and we disqualify it and, and say, it's not a deal and you take it to someone else. They're probably going to tell you the same thing. And if they don't, I would just double check to make sure they know what they're talking about because there's a lot of people that, like Jack said, get shiny object syndrome and will just get excited to try to force a deal out of nothing. And so you just want to be careful about where you're spending your time because you don't want to chase a deal that's not worth pursuing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. That's not my intentions, right? I think my intentions are... um, I respect what you've taught me. And I think in two days I've learned just as much as I did when I started re- being a realtor, um, just calling the leads. And then what I've learned from you guys, you give me the tools I need. So for my appreciation and what I respect out of you guys, that's why, you know, I don't expect that, but I do have people that I trust that do are, are in interest of this stuff and know people that I can go to that, you know, might be an option for that. But my goal would definitely be talk to you guys and make sure you're okay with it once it's disqualified, if it ever gets to that point, which I hope it doesn't. Um, and then just leave it at that point. That would kind of be my goal, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. That's all I was thinking. Yeah, man. No, I mean, I, I think that sounds good. And I, and I totally appreciate, um, you know, that attitude and, and uh, respect and whatnot right there. So that's awesome, man. I appreciate that. Not a problem. And then they had a question about the PITI statement exactly. I think they're wanting a better understanding of how to Uh, bring that up to an agent and not get shut down. And then also maybe adding it to our script because I know the actual like we have, of course, the call recordings and stuff. But then within the script itself, I don't think we ever added onto that with like specifics in terms of asking this with the PITI and exacts. It was more so just verbal things we've said and then in the recordings. Yeah. But maybe um, I can make an adjustment to that later tonight and, and add it into the script. Yeah. I think we could do that today. Yeah. Cause I think that was kind of the question. Uh, yeah. You know what? We could actually do that. The next zoom Saturday zoom, we can cover that Daniel. Um, we'll look at a couple deals and like the math on them. Um, and then that'll be, that'll be good. Cause we could probably look at a couple of deals and then record them too. Um, yeah. So I guess right now we can jump into role play. I actually have to hop on a call at five. So that's like 15 minutes, but if we get kind of get everyone in breakout rooms and then maybe me and Alex just kind of bounce around, do you think, does that sound like a good structure? Yeah, let's do it. You're, you're host of the zoom. So we'll see how this breakout room stuff goes. I can't remember the last time I'd, Ran a Zoom with breakout rooms. I got this, man. Don't worry. <laughs> Just one thing to consider is it's going to be groups of two. And so you're just going to want to take turns. One person being an agent, one person being 
us the, the cold callers and you just want to remember to not make it super easy for them but also make it so they could at least get some good practice and have a good conversation with you yeah so yeah. not shut down no we're not interested in sub two <laughs> yeah I'll let them get into like two to three minutes into the conversation and then just switch and rinse and repeat yeah and we'll uh i guess alex and i'll kind of bounce around between groups and stuff as well if there's any questions or just to chime in cool all right uh everyone's gonna get sent to breakout room now